The last section in chapter four is rates of change. We've already done a whole chapter on rates of change in chapter two. I'm just going to review some of the concepts from there. And the methods that we previously used to calculate rate of change, where we can use those methods with polynomial functions. So just a quick recap, uh, average rate of change, that's your slope between two points. So x1 is your first point and x2 is your second point and you sub into your slope formula, which used to be y2 minus y1. Graphically, this is equivalent to the slope of a secant line passing through these two points. Instantaneous rate of change is a little bit different. It comes from the same formula, but we use the difference quotient where we have h on the denominator and h is a very small value. So we're we're subbing in if you're looking for example the rate of change of, the, of a graph when x is 5 then your a would be a 5 and then you'd go just to the right of 5 at, uh, adding on 0 0.001 adding on a hundredth or something onto that graphically this is equivalent to estimating the slope of the tangent line remember the tangent line just touches at one spot on a curve so technically this is two spots on a curve because we're at at an x value and then right beside that x value, but it's really, really close. So we're estimating the slope of the tangent line by really calculating the slope of a secant line that are two points that are really close together. And the instantaneous rate of change of a polynomial function, the instantaneous rate of change of any polynomial function at its turning point is zero. So when we're at a turning point, the, the slope of the tangent line there is zero. In the last class, you used graphing technology to find two points close to each other on a curve, this curve representing the population of Canada. Now we only, we had a restricted domain, right? The population of Canada is not gonna drop down like that. So you had to look at the average rate of, average rate of change between two points on the curve. If you connected those two points, you would have a secant line. But the orange line here is a tangent line. It's been drawn at one point uh, when t equals 1997. So it's just below 2000 here. Then if we can draw this orange line is supposed to be touching just at that one point there at 1997. And here, tangent lines, remember, should only cross, uh, should only touch the graph once in a very small localized area. This one does cross again up here and that's okay but within within a very small uh, space around the point in question it should only be crossing once so the question is how can we use it the orange line to calculate the instantaneous rate of change at 1997. so one way to do this is um, to look at yesterday's work where um, one of your answers you had to calculate this in one of your answers, part B, I think the third part, but what we're gonna do right now is look at the slope of the tangent line. So let me write this over here. So using our notation, M is for slope, and I'm just gonna put a little subscript of the word tan, which means the slope of the tangent line. So we're looking for the slope of the tangent line, and to find the slope of the tangent line, we need two points on that orange line. So we need to find two points on the orange line to find the slope of the tangent line. So we could take this one here, we should take the, the actual point of tangency, and that was from last class, we got that was 1997. And let me write, we, I'll put a few decimal places here. We have 26,000. 105.998. This is all approximation. And we can take another point on the line. Um, either if we can find, so remember what we're looking for in the question, it says, how can we use this to calculate the instantaneous rate of change? So to use that point to find the instantaneous rate of change, I would need to find another point that my orange line goes through clearly. So let's say I'm looking along the dotted line and I think, well, it's pretty hard to tell. Maybe, maybe this one here where I'm putting a blue dot, I could get the coordinates of that one maybe and use those two, the red and the blue and calculate the instantaneous rate of change there. 
question just asking how can we do it so we can get need we need two points on the tangent line and if we get two points on the tangent line we can calculate the slope between them that will give us the slope of the tangent line that's one way to do it the graph of a polynomial function is shown estimate the instantaneous rate of change of the function when x equals 1. So going back to the example that we just did, we were talking about how do we get the instantaneous rate of change from, from a graph. Well, if you have the tangent line, then you can get two points on the tangent line and get its slope. That will give you the instantaneous rate of change. We don't have any tangent lines drawn here. We're going to estimate the instantaneous rate of change when x equals 1. And we've got some steps written out first here. So x equals 1 is here. Here's our x value of 1. So that means way up here on the graph where it hits the graph, I want to know this. I want to know how my function is changing when x is 1. So I would like to get the slope of the tangent line right there. We're going to first start by determining an equation of the function. This will be better than, look at this part b. We're going to draw a tangent line for at a different point. But if I just drew a tangent line at 1 here, I would be really getting an answer based on a lot of uh, several different things that I could be doing which have a margin of error, drawing the line myself. So let's try to do it algebraically. Let's get a deter let's get an equation of the function first. Which form is best to use? Factored, standard, or transformed? Remember, transformed form is the one where we have a vertex. So this is a quartic here. I can tell by the shape of it. It's degrees four. So in, we, won't, we don't have an equation for that in transformed form because in transformed form, the quartic is the, is the U, the very flattened kind of U shape. So we're not going to use that form. Factored form is easier here. For factored form, remember when we do our factors, well, let's, get, let's take a look at the graph here first of all. So I'm going to start off with writing out the format. Factored form, this is a quartic, so it could look like this x minus, and then we would have 1, 0. We could have four of these because it's a quartic, so I'm going to write out four of these. And we could also have a leading coefficient or a greatest common factor, so I'm also going to put that at the front. That would be an a value. So let's put an a value at the front here. That's what our uh, factored form looks like. Now, what can we sub in here? Look at the graph. At negative 3, I've got a bounce. That means I'm going to have two of these, x plus 3, x plus 3. Two of my factors are going to look like that. I also have one at 0, so that would be a factor of x minus 0, which I will just write as x. And then my other x-intercept is at 1 half, but I can't put a factor like this, 1 half. I have to write, I have to use integers only. So when I write this one out, I have to write it as, so this is, let me erase that and change it to, let's work with the 0. This is x equals 1 half. I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. 2x two equals 1, bring the 1 over. 2x minus 1 equals 0. So that's what we'll write. So back up to the equation. I've got f at x equals, I don't know what a is. I'm going to put two of my factors together because of that bounce. x plus 3 squared. I've got this, my second one here is just an x. I'm going to put that at the front. That'll go with my a. I'm going to make some more room there for that. So I'm going to. Use, I need my a value, and I have a single x for my. It's an a. I have a single x. That's for my zero zero, and then my last factor is two x minus one. Remember, we have to have integers in factored form. You have to have integers. So we need to find the a value. How do we find the a value? We pick a point on the graph and we sub it in. So let's take a look at the graph and find a spot on the graph that crosses clearly through the grid lines of two nice clean integers. I'd rather not have to guess. Um, 
I'm going to try this one here. It looks like negative 220. Now you might have picked a different one and, and that's fine. So we're going to sub in negative 220. Remember that this is an X and this is a Y, so we've got to be sure to put them in the right spot. In for my Y or F at X is 20. A, we don't know. X is negative 2. Okay, so let's uh, simplify all that and we get, uh, will you work on that? and then do that yourself. I'm going to press pause here. I'm going to finish it up and when you come back you'll see the answer. Okay, so I've got uh, a equals 2. This was a minus 1 here, not a plus 1. a equals 2. So now what's the equation? Now I have to go back up here and where I had the a, I've got to put the 2 in there. Okay, I put my equation here and so let's go back to the question. It says we're, we're looking for the instantaneous rate of change of f at x when x equals 1. So the first thing I had to do was come up with an equation. And now I'm going to use the difference quotient twice. Remember we would do this to estimate the instantaneous rate of change. So the difference quotient, I'm going to use an h value of decimal 0, 1. And then we could repeat with decimal 0, 0, 1. So let's just start with, um, we'll start with the difference quotient. Uh, the difference quotient is an average rate of change, right? And then we'll do it twice. We'll call it instantaneous rate of change. Average rate, average rate of change, f at a plus h minus f at a all over h. So what is a? a is the point that we're looking for the point of tangency. So I'm going to go on the graph. It was at 1. I'm going to go up there one. I can't tell. It looks like it's 130, but I'm not exactly sure. I'll figure it out though, but I'm looking for an f at 1, and then I'm going to use an h value of 0 0.01 minus f at 1 all over 0 0.01. So now we sub into our equation that's in kind of dark red there. I'm going to sub in 1.01. Put, put a box around it here. I've got to put sub in 1.01 into this equation, then I've got to sub in 1, and I'm just going to use two decimal places, so I've already done that, um, and you should practice it as well, but we get 33.13, subtract 32, so that 32, so f at 1 is actually, I put the coordinate on the graph here, it's actually 1 comma 32, that's the coordinate there, it's up here. That's where the coordinate is of the graph of, at 1. All over 0 0.01. That gives me approximately an answer of 113.14. So that's telling me that the average rate of change, we can also call, we can call it an instantaneous rate of change, but it's approximate, right? Because um, what we're looking at on the graph is we're looking at when our x value is 1, which is 132, and then we're going right beside it at 1.01. So we're still technically on the red line, which means it's technically a secant line because we've just found the coordinates of two points on this function and we calculated the slope between them. We calculated the slope between two points that are super close together. That's what we're doing here. We get 113. That's a big number because imagine drawing a tangent line right here. That's going to be pretty steep. So we have a, a big number here. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole process. We did it all in chapter two, but what you would do here is repeat, all, repeat this all again. I'll put it over here, repeat. The question said, well, in the suggestion, it said twice, right? So I would repeat with h equals 0 0.001, maybe. That would be a squeezing interval. Um, do it all again and average the two of them together. And then I could say, um, therefore, the instantaneous rate of change is approximately, and it'll be the average of those numbers. You add them and divide by 2. So it's, it's still going to be very close to 113. So that's kind of a review of the difference quotient. Part B for the question is the one that's um, a little more abstract. 
draw a tangent line to the graph at x equals 1 half and determine its equation. Okay, I'm going to go to a uh, black pen here, or purple. x equals 1 half. Uh, what is f at 1 half? So let me make sure I get the coordinate right. f at 1 half. Let's sub that in. So you're going to sub in 1 half into the equation, or maybe you can, maybe you know, or you can tell exactly what it is. It's 0. We already got this point when we were doing our zeros right here. I'm going to erase the circle actually that it's around, and I'll erase all this work here so we can see a little better. f at 1 half is 0. I'm going to put a dot right there on the 0. And I want to draw a tangent line there. So I'm going to get my ruler, and this is going to be really hard, but I'm going to try to draw a, so here's a little sketch of what it shouldn't look like. Uh, that's not good. I will try again like that. So I'm going to just try and draw a sketch that actually goes through my tangent line. So I'll get my ruler and I'll try to do a better job of that. It, it is hard with this tablet, but uh, you get the idea. So I want you to try and do that too. I'll press pause. So there's my tangent line. It's not great. I think it should have been more steep than that because it looks like it's cutting through again here. Uh, this is the problem when we try to draw our own tangent line. So what I, the question says, draw a tangent line. I did that badly, but uh, to the graph at x equals 1 half, then determine its equation. So that means determine the equation of the tangent line. So the equation of a line from grade 9 is y equals mx plus b. Now we know, um, no, well, we know the y, well, we don't know the y-intercept. Let me just not jump ahead there. Let's go to the slope. Uh, to calculate the slope of this purple line, I'm going to try, so you would be looking at your own line, I'm looking at my line, and I'm trying to find a nice point here. Maybe I'll use this one on my tangent line. The coordinate here is about 1, 7, I think. This is an approximation, right? And my line should have been steeper in the first place, so this isn't perfect. So to find the slope of my tangent line, I'm going to use the the actual point of tangency which is one half zero and one seven so it often helps to label which one comes first the one half is the first x that i hit it's the lowest one so this is my x1 the other one is my x2 then i have a y1 at zero and a y2 at seven so i'm going to sub those into y2 minus y1 the slope formula seven minus zero over 1 minus 1 half. 7 minus 0 over 1 minus 1 half. That's 7 over a half. And 7 divided by a half is the same as 7 times 2, 14. So I have a slope of 14. I'm going to go back over to my slope formula, uh, my equation, sorry, and I've got my slope. So I take my equation in for m. I'm going to put a 14, and then I have to find b. So I have y equals 14x plus b. Next step is to find the b. That's the y-intercept. So uh, I had a different graph before you could see it. You can't really see the y-intercept here. If I look at the graph, just to get just to get an idea if I'm right or wrong, I can see my y-intercept would be down here somewhere. But I'm going to actually calculate it correctly. So to calculate b, to find the y-intercept, to find b, I'm going to sub in another point for x and y. So let's sub in um, one of my two that I used for slope. I can choose either of them. I'm going to choose the one without a fraction just to make my life easier. So I'm putting 7 here equals 14 times 1 plus b. That gives me 7 equals 14 plus b. And when I subtract 14 from both sides, I get a b value of negative 7. And that does look reasonable with what I just talked about here when I said, um, where do you think it will intersect? So that looks reasonable that my b value would be a negative 7. Well, I now have an equation for my line. My tangent line equation is about, roughly, y equals my slope was 14x minus 7. So there's the equation of that purple tangent line. And you would have a different one than I do, 
probably your, your tangent line is better than mine is, and you have a better equation. But that's how we come up with the equation of the tangent line. Part C of the same question says for the tangent function, or sorry, for the function f at x, over what intervals is the tangent slope positive, negative, and zero? So this goes back to unit two as well. If you've forgotten this, I suggest you review unit two. Where, is the, where would the tangent slope be positive? Meaning if I took any point on the graph, say right here, and I drew a tangent line there, it would be going like this, that slope would be negative. So if we're going to just stay, say where the slope is positive, negative, or zero. So let's just um, identify the turning points here. So I'll put a dot here that we have a turning point at negative 3, 0. And the y value doesn't really matter. The x value does. This turning point looks like it's about negative 1 and a half, I think, negative 1 and a half and 27 and we have another one uh, it's not exactly negative one and a half is it? okay that's all right we have another turning point down here at that's a quarter i think 0 0.25 is the x value and the y value is maybe let's say negative three the turning points are important now we want to find out where the slope of the tangent is positive. So the way I'm going to write that in short form is m is for slope, and then t, a n, so subscript m tan, on where the slope of the tangent is positive. That's the first part we're supposed to do. So where is the slope of the tangent positive? Let's look back at the graph. So the slope of the tangent is positive, this meaning our function is increasing here. All the tangent slopes would be positive here, and they would also all be positive here. So on those two sections of the graph, the slope of the tangent is positive. And the way I'm going to write that, I'll use set notation, is between negative 3, and I don't include x because at the turning point it's 0, and that goes up to, I figured my y value there is negative 1 and a half. If you picked a different uh, x value, if you pick different x values, it's fine. These are estimations here. You might have negative 1.4. So that's one part. Also, remember our union symbol here? Also, the very last leg of the graph there, that's when x is greater than I have uh, 0 0.25, you might have 0 0.27, 0 0.25. That's when the slope of the tangent is positive. So that's this section here, we have positive slopes, and this section here, the graph is going up from left to right, it's going up. The next part we have to do is negative. So where are the slopes of the tangent negative? Slopes of the tangent are negative. Coming down here, this is all negative. And this part here is all negative. So the slopes of the tangent are negative there. And uh, just for variety, I will use interval notation. X is an element of, so my first section is negative infinity, which always gets a round bracket. You, negative or positive infinity get round brackets. And from negative infinity to negative 3. Again, not, I'm not going to put a square bracket here because the square bracket indicates we're including that value and negative 3 is a turning point so it's got to be a round bracket. In union with, the next section is from negative 1.5 to negative, uh, positive a quarter. So that's interval notation. The last part is asking when is when are the slopes of the tangents zero? Zero means flat. Remember Mr. Slope Guy? Let me draw Mr. Slope Guy here. Positive is going up. Negative is coming down. S vertical is undefined and straight is a slope of zero. So there's our Mr. Slope Guy. We're looking for where the slope is 
flat, that's at the turning point. So I would draw a horizontal line here and a horizontal line here and another one at the turning point. So at all the turning points. So the slope of our tangent is zero when, oh, we have specific values here, when x equals negative three, negative one and a quarter, and 0 0.25. So I used um, decimals and fractions. You might notice in this question, uh, whenever we have tangent lines and slopes, you can go with decimals the whole time because we usually get decimal answers for rates of change. Um, I, but if there are no decimals or fractions in the question, fractions are usually better. In this case, 0.25 is an exact value. 0.25 is equal to one quarter. So this, I just used a number that has an exact value there, but the question, um, you could use decimals throughout if you want to. That's part C. That's, that's going over all the different slope possibilities for that graph. Part D, calculate the average rate of change over this interval. Now, I, I got a euro symbol in there. That, should be an element symbol so let's pretend that's what it says we're looking for the average rate of change that means you're going to get to use your good old slope formula from grade nine i'm going to put a dot on the graph when x equals a half we're looking for the average rate of change from when x is a half to x is one and we remember from before that was 132 was that point here remember that was 132 and this one is one half zero i want to find the average rate of change. That means the line connecting those two black dots. It's a secant line. It's an average rate of change. It's a slope. So the average rate of change is equal to, there's different ways to write it. You can put the change in f at x, which is the change in y or the change in x. You can just go straight to the slope formula. You could write f at x2 minus f at x1 over x2 minus x1. Uh, in any case, we're going to get 32 minus 0 over 1 minus 1 half. That is 32 divided by a half, which is 32 times 2, which is 64. And yeah, 64. Very steep. That's a pretty big number. And we look at the two blue dots, the line, uh, black dots, sorry, the lines that would connect them would be very steep as well as well so the average rate of change therefore the average rate of change is 64. we have no units on that because we're just on a cartesian plane right here there is also another method for calculating rates of change which is algebraic manipulation and that's the um, true instantaneous rate of change is using algebraic manipulation that's doing it all algebraically we're not guessing at any coordinates or trying to figure out how to draw a tangent line so i would like you to review algebraically manipulate the difference quotient for number 9a 10 a b and 12 uh, and it, it's long that's a it's a long way to do it right and 13. the other questions have intervals given so just like this one gave you an interval so that means you're going to do an average rate of change and there's some corrections here from your textbook that's the end of the lesson and don't forget to review chapter two if you have forgotten about rates of change.